Krishna for the very generous introduction. You know, uh, as part of my three years at I, I, I Seed, I always admired when Krishna introduced speakers. Because, <laughs> I mean, the uh, top doctors in the world, and so I never imagined you'd introduce me, so it kind of feels I'm trying to adjust to the introduction here. So thanks, Krishna, for that. I also want to thank Wendy, uh, who uh, we met uh, now almost two years at the Big Data uh, Consortium meeting at the NIH, and you know, we talked about doing work in Kenya, and she invited me uh, to, uh, to speak, and, and so I'm really delighted. Unfortunately, uh, she's not here in person, but I believe she's uh, you know, listening to us uh, remotely. So, hi, Wendy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, wow, okay, I'm here. I'm, the food is delicious, so I'm not sure if the turnout was for me. <laughs> so let's see uh, at the end of the hour whether it was worth worth it. But uh, let's see. Good. Now um, I'd like to engage you in sort of a, the um, the polar spectrum of you know um, one looking at global health in the traditional sense, which is typically approached from a development perspective, where policy, uh, working through government trying to make things happen through the public sector is the mainstream. And you have, you know, pretty much the major stakeholders, all the donor partners involved. So there's big, mighty dollars, a lot of policy, big government behind global health. And then you have social entre entrepreneurship, where you have a person like myself with nothing in the pocket, trying to make a difference in the, uh, in, in sort of, uh, resource limited settings with a lens on entrepreneurship. Now, at the end of the exercise, really, I, I'd really like you to ask the question are we an access to health company or are we a distribution company? Are we an access to health company or are we a distribution company? And I think it would really help you in whatever work you're doing to kind of figure out which company you are what kind of company you are. Now, my journey started in 2011, uh, uh, the, the work I'll be talking about, when I met this mother and child. This was in the western part of Kenya, specifically in a village called Kasongo. Kasongo is in the um, hinter part of, um, of the Kisumu area, close to the belt, the sugarcane belt, where there's a lot of sugarcane mills. There's the Nandi Hills at the background. Now, uh, this mother comes with the baby, and she gives the nurse, they tell the nurse exactly what is happening. She says, my baby has not been eating for the last three days. He has had a fever and he has a soft head. Now the nurse, uh, to cut a long story short, quickly diagnoses malaria. Now I walk in shortly after that, five minutes after the diagnosis has been written in the book, and I say, wow, nurse, uh, what's going on here? I see the mother is here with the, uh, this, the mother and the baby are with the grandmother and with the father. Now, there are three people accompanying a six-month-old baby, and you'd say, okay, well, there's something unusual here. If you've practiced in, the, in that setting, you know three parents, especially when the father is carrying the baby, you know it's serious. And I think it's sort of that thing where the father thinks he can walk faster than the mother, so in crisis, <laughs> is the father carrying the baby. If it's not a crisis, it's just the mother who is with the baby. So that's really the alarm signal that went off. And as I said, what's going on? And uh, she says it's a malaria. I said, I don't think it's a malaria. Just be, why should three people be here for a malaria in this day and age? It turns out that the nurse had missed the di has missed, had missed, diagnosed the baby. Now, the, the mother had given the nurse all the signs and symptoms that she needed to make establish a diagnosis. Soft head is not what we usually look at in classical medicine, but it's bulging of the fontanels. For anterior fontanels, when the bulge in meningitis. So basically, the mother had given away the symptoms, or the, the uh, diagnosis. It was a meningitis, with the primary source being a left, a, uh, a right lower lobe pneumonia. So the baby was crushed on the side, hyperventilating, not eating, having fever, and was three days with the complication of meningitis. Now, so we stepped in and we said, okay, we need to get this baby a very serious antibiotic. Unfortunately, that antibiotic is not part of the essential drug list. It's a um, uh, uh, third generation cephalosporin, which we needed to give the baby as soon as possible so that baby could survive. 
We prescribed the medicine. We didn't want to go with the first line um, antibiotics. That would not help the baby uh, waste resources. So we said, please rush and get this medicine. There may be a clinic down the road. We sent the mother there. She took a <coughs> motorbike 15 minutes down the road, got there. The medicine was not there. She was directed from there to the district hospital in Ahero, which is about 30 minutes by another motorbike ride. She got there and the medicine was not there. She was then redirected from Ahero district to Kisumu General Hospital, and that is when the medicine was there. By which time it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. When we diagnosed the baby, it was 8 o'clock in the morning. She told it cost $40 for that, med for that antibiotic. She didn't have the money. She had to come back all the way to the village, get money, and go back. By the time treatment started, it was 8 p.m. By some stroke of luck, the baby survived. So I tell the story in a, in a very affirmative way. The baby survived. Now, at that point, I kind of say, if we are thinking about technology and we think about global health, what is our mandate? Are we just collecting data, health records, for the sake of it? Because that's really where I was starting to say, can we create efficiency in data collection? And that really set me on a path and set my mission to say, we want to create systems where we can efficiently uh, create access to medicines. Now, uh, so that is the story that got me started. So we have grown as a company in 2011, where we started looking at programs in the clinics to say, how can we get mothers to come to the clinics, access to health, come to the clinics to get care? And we created an incentive program which uh, I'll talk about a little later on. But then as we started working with the facilities, we said, let us create an electronic medical record system such that as they are seeing, as they are providing service in the clinics, the central warehouse, the supply company, Kemsa, can see the data real time. And that way, we can minimize stock out <coughs> in the facilities. So what happened, the, um, the incident that happened wouldn't happen, wouldn't occur. We partnered with Huawei Technologies, which is uh, one of the largest technology partners in Kenya, and we're able to scale our technology to uh, at least 60 sites. Then, as we started looking at opportunities in the market, we said, okay, can we create a mobile app to resolve the problem, where you could easily tell where are the drugs, where are the doctors, what's the cost of medicines, really trying to solve the problem that Clifford had, the baby that I talked about. And now we are looking at expanding our services through clinics. So we've scaled through vertical integration. We started as an IT company, moved into distribution now in health service delivery. You might ask, why do that? I will save the question, the answer for later. Uh, but we have grown and um, we have learned a lot in the process. Now, our core business right now, uh, we are in the urban setting. Uh, we have both an urban and a rural strategy. In the urban setting, we now supply drugs to <laughs> over 33 companies. Our target is to supply drugs to about 150 corporations. A lot of these corporations have members with chronic conditions who exhaust their benefits within five years, within five months out of the year. So even though they're insured, they are struggling to have access to medicines. And so we are the preferred partner for a lot of the corporations uh, making sure that they have access to medicines. Now, just to give you a flavor for the diseases that we're talking about, um, you have most of the conditions, upper respiratory tract infections, gastrointestinal disorders, and you know, about 40% of the claims are driven by these conditions here, urinary tract infections, diabetes, hypertension, STDs, and family planning. <laughs> so one of the things we're doing, and I'll just touch on it very briefly, is to understand how in the urban setting we could introduce managed care. Now, the reason for us introducing managed care as a company is that despite the low accuracy of those conditions, most of the employees are still getting uh, care in hospital settings. In the hospital setting, the average cost per claim is 6,700 shillings, that is about $67. Compared to the outpatient setting, where it's mostly the drugs you buy, where the cost of medicines is $36. So they, if we can successfully um, shift the traffic outside of the hospital settings, then we can hopefully help a lot of employees stretch their medical benefits. So what we're doing is uh, one of the, uh, uh, the, the things we're setting up right now is what's called checkups. It's a model we're trying to introduce to the market to say, can we offer rapid diagnostic care in the urban setting 
to reduce hospital-based care. So you come in, you get diagnosed, you leave, and then we, we dispatch the medicines to your office or your lab results. So you don't have to spend over 15 minutes. Right now, the average employee spends four to six hours in the hospital, out of which three to four hours are just waiting, waiting to see the doctor, waiting for the uh, labs, waiting for the, uh, for the medicines. And so we are getting a fair amount of demand for rapid diagnostic services. And so this is this facility we're setting with six consultation rooms, 15 minute turnaround times. This is the doctor's office, this is the staff lounge, and then this is the lab. So uh, it is, I'm very excited about it. Uh, but what's really unique about it is that we have created a space that is dedicated for patient education. So we're running concurrent patient education sessions for persons with cancer, diabetes, and hypertension, really saying we want to invest in health education in the clinical setting. Whereas, and that is pretty unique uh, in, in our opinion. Now, uh, back to the, uh, the other work that we do, in the rural setting, our goal is to say, can we create a scalable model, <coughs> a scalable community-related <coughs> model for management of chronic diseases in resource-limited settings? And that is a tall order. Now, in terms of developing the product and the go-to-market, we've had to optimize the service delivery model. We've had to uh, optimize the technology integration, gone through a lot of processes to optimize the business model. Now we're at the phase where we're looking at the staffing and management, then we look at training and we look at impact. And the ones in Asterix are areas where we feel we can partner with academic institutions to really help us figure out those aspects of our work. Now, uh, I thought it'd be important to sort of share my journey and sort of how, where, where, where did I start and how has that influenced sort of my direction and what I've chosen to do. Now, when I started in global health, oh, excuse me, uh, let's see. Press the same button you just pressed again. Oh, there you go. Okay. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of what we're doing is acute and infectious disease control. And that has been the main thrust of global health, HIV, malaria, but, uh, pregnancy, and so on and so forth. That is a very different paradigm. You think, you're thinking about a single agent, the seasonality in the occurrence of diseases, so it's a controlled ex environment for the most part. You're looking at usually risk groups, whereby it could it be a condition that affects children zero to five, or in the case of maternal and child health, 18 to 45. Uh, when you start looking at maternal child health, you also start looking at delays in healthcare, risk groups, again, very well defined, interventions around standardization of care. When you come to chronic diseases, it's a very different beast. You're talking about multi agent issues, year round uh, uh, needs, delays in care contributing to the, to the issue, people anywhere from zero to 100 years being part of the equation. And the intervention requires multi-agent uh, treatment and a fair amount of standardization. And so if you think about it from that perspective, I could easily argue that right now our systems are quite ill-equipped to deal with chronic conditions. And so creating a model for chronic condition, in my opinion, is an imperative. And one that I would say uh, is uh, given the urgency, you know, uh, there is a lot of room for improvement. Now, when I started working in, to make the point, I started working uh, shortly after medical school on Konzo, which is a paralytic disorder associated with the uh, intake of, um, uh, of, of cyanide from cassava. And the chronic cyanide levels causes an upper motor neuron uh, disease. And the children would get up in the morning after eating cassava during the dry season, they're going to paralysis, and then they are, they're crippled for life. So that's really what I did. And I worked with Hans Rosling at the time. Some of you may know him. And Tokyo Tileska, they were my supervisors in Sweden. And we described the first cases of Konzo in Central Africa, leading to WHO recognizing the disease as a distinct disease. Now, the beauty about it was that, um, uh, and then later on, I uh, went to do my doctorate in pharmacology and toxicology and worked with Dr. Anders at the University of Rochester, where we tried to characterize the toxic intermediates 
that were being that were associated with the neuronal damage. And my thesis was around identifying the um, some of the the intermediates that are <coughs> toxic to the central nervous system uh, element. Now, uh, just what just so you know what's happening at cassava, you have to soak it for three days, and then you dry it. In that process. This moiety that contains glucose and the cyanide moiety is broken down and then ultimately cyanide is released. So if you soak the cassava for three days, the cyanide um, gets out of the cassava and then it's safe to eat. If you soak it for less than two days, then you have high levels of residual cyanide in the final product, the, uh, the cassava flour, and when the children ingest it, then it puts them at risk of toxicity. Now, the outbreaks in these conditions were associated with either seasonal patterns where dry season, with the, in the dry season where the concentrations of cyanide in the cassava are extremely high, and or, you know, uh, environmental factors that caused mass um, uh, trading of these cassava from the villages to the rural city. And so this was on a process to meet demand, and then people will then now eat this and cause toxicity. All to say that for most of the issues that we have been looking at in global health, they, are this, they fit this model. Single agent, single causality, there is some seasonality. You can identify a cohort of patients, you can intervene. And in this case, WHO recognized Konzo as a foodborne disease, and the intervention was pretty straightforward. Educate, create awareness, and stuff like that, right? And we were able to reduce the incidence of Konzo. Right now, Konzo is not as prevalent as it, um, globally. Now, uh, then in 2011, uh, while I was doing my master's in healthcare management, I had no intention of going to this, but then I hear on the radio that the maternal child health indicators are going in the wrong direction. I have a very serious deficit that once I hear that, I get too excited, and immediately I resign from my job to go do this work, to say, what's going on? <laughs> so that's really how I ended up. I wish we more fancy story. But, so I went to the dean's office, Julio Frank, and I said, uh, I'd really like to do something, because he had moved the maternal task force to the School of Public Health, and so I said, I really want to be part of the, the team that is working on understanding what is going on. Why is the maternal child health indicator going in the wrong direction? Whereas you have more doctors, more facilities, more awareness, more money, more medicines. Why is that happening? And so that's really what got me started. And this is the clinic where I decided to work. And this is the clinic where I met Clifford, right? And so I worked with the nurses here, Carol and, um, and Jacqueline, to understand what was going on. Long story short uh, was that mothers were just not coming to the clinics for a variety of reasons. And so our intervention was, can we create awareness and drive the children here? Believe it or not, by a stroke of luck, we started manufacturing uh, clothes, uh, onesies, and the mother started coming. We moved the uh, skill delivery from 17% to over 64% in the, all the sites. We had 30 sites where we did the pilot. And today we've served over 12,000 babies. None has died in our hands, and that is pretty remarkable. We have created a card game which the mothers play to learn about the risks for antenatal care. And in this instance, it's a clear scenario whereby access was the issue. And we look for ways either through education, incentives, or re eliminating some of the barriers to improve access to care. And that was done, uh, I, we founded a not-for-profit called 2020 Microclinic Initiative to do this work. And the work continues under the leadership of Dean Davidson, and we received a fair amount of awards, including the GSK Save the Children uh, Award. <coughs> then, in the process of doing that, we uh, set up ZD, which was the enterprise application, uh, as Krishna mentioned, introduction, uh, has been adopted by the government. And we have some lessons learned there. <laughs> Uh, the idea being that can we improve collection of data and make the gaps visible in real time? So, uh, so that is part of the work we have done. Now, uh, back to NCDs and the opportunity that we're looking at from an entrepreneurial perspective. Uh, this, is a, this is data from the NCD strategy map for Kenya, where you see that by 2030, the uh, death from cancer would be equivalent to that of HIV. 
The death from cardiovascular diseases would be equivalent to or would surpass the death from malaria or tuberculosis. So there is a clear indication that NTDs would define the future. And are the systems in place adequate to deal with this? I mean, the issue they um, currently I'd say are absolutely not. <coughs> And so there is a, um, the, the Ministry of Health, the, the National Health Strategy has, has identified uh, nine priority areas or indicators uh, to, to sort of monitor and, and sort of manage the, uh, the, 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 the NCD uh, target. Now, all the items in blue are great, but those are preventive measures. And if you think about it from an entrepreneur's perspective, they really, there's no money to be made there. There's no sustainability. That is the role of government. Well, that's the role of policy institutions. So really, looking at it from the perspective of, that, uh, of an entrepreneur, we said, what can we do to improve access to essential entity medicines? And how can we improve drug treatment in remote areas? And that really established the, uh, the phase, the, um, the framework for our scaling uh, model. Now, uh, it may be obvious to some, but just in terms of context, uh, as far as NCDs are concerned, where persons are required to take medicines quasi every day in order to uh, be healthy, the uh, numbers and the cost of care becomes quite material. And in Kenya right now, on average, the Kenyan pays 32 times more for a pill than their counterpart with an equivalent diagnosis in the UK. So we have a huge opportunity to reduce the cost of care based on the cost of medicines. And this is data from Cosmos uh, Pharmaceuticals. For some medicines, just to give you a sense, if you have to take the medicines throughout the year, <coughs> if you're taking the locally manufactured generics, you can save upwards of $270 <coughs> per year for if per household for that particular drug. And you comparing it with important generics, you're looking at $43, just to give a sense of the amount of savings that could occur. Now, the challenge here from, an, from a social enterprise perspective, this is great to be able to move the market from uh, branded from branded products to imported generics down to local manufactured generics. But the bottom line is that once you go down this trend, entrepreneurship becomes 10 orders of magnitude more difficult. How can you distribute medicines with very little margins to remote areas and be sustainable? So we are looking at a model to say, yes, it is good to, to think about low cost generics. That's very good for the patient but it makes the business model quite difficult. So the question is for us as a company, how can we move the medicines from Nairobi to the rural areas with minimal cost? And that is really what the social innovation halls are about, to say we can indeed get the medicines there without increasing the price by 75%, which is what currently happens in the market. Now, uh, the second challenge with chronic conditions is the absolute shortage of healthcare facilities, which makes the ability to diagnose follow-up care quite a barrier. Now, uh, this is a, a clinic that is serving 1,000 households, and then I think there are 1,000 households here in this picture. Now, the public dispensary, if it runs out of medicines, which it does 60% of the time, 64% of the time or more, you can't find your medicines, then you have 1,000 households that are out of the medicines. Uh, very few, a lot of the diabetics do not have access to medicines. Insulin is not part, is not part of the essential, it's, it's sort of part of the essential drug list that is a short-acting insulin, but not the long-acting insulin. You have metformin, you may have sulfonylureas, but the um, public health facilities lack a lot of the medicines. And so people are now forced to travel long distances to get access to medicines. So you have the issue of affordability, you have the issue of shortage, not only of medicines, but of prescribers. Then you have the issue of distance to travel. 
when you look at the profile of the patient with chronic conditions, most of them are seniors. They use walking sticks. So if the clinic is five miles away or 10 miles away, it is a pretty tall order to get to the clinic, literally. So when we're talking about chronic conditions, we're looking at a very different spectrum of issues here. You need prescribers, you need diagnosis, you need reliable sources of medicines, and mobility becomes an issue. Affordability is an issue. Literacy and numeracy is an issue. So how do you design a business? How do you design a service model that addresses all of these items in tandem and, and, and be sustainable? So, oh, excuse me, sorry. I'm not gonna hang up this yet, sorry. <laughs> So what we decided the year about two years ago, thanks to a grant and we had with the Berger, from Berger Ingelheim, was to design a methodology to reach more people and design a distribution model to get medicines to the remote areas. We <coughs> called it social innovation hubs. We wanted to be true to our roots around technology. We wanted to be true to the fact that we kind of have to think about a social inclusive model to make this work. The hubs, we set up eight, we closed down five, three are currently up and running. Uh, the hub is a place, we didn't want it to be a clinic. We wanted, to, we wanted it to be a place where people would organically come for social interactions and then use the opportunity to introduce them to uh, the health service, either do screening, do education. They could place their, med order, or their order for medicines, pay, and then we deliver. That way, we are reducing our cost of acquisition cost. We are reducing our uh, cost of stocking medicines on site. And we are intensely focused on patient education. So this was version 101 of the hub. Version 101 of the hubs failed. Not because it couldn't work, but because of the policy constraints around what it takes to provide healthcare services. We had to be licensed, we had to tile the floors, you had to do all these fancy things in order to get a license to so provide services. And now, if you think about it from an entrepreneurial perspective, our costs are going up, and the opportunity to serve the patients were defaulting back into a hospital model. So we kind of had to figure out how do we set it up such that we would get licensed by the local authorities without adding a cost of operations. <coughs> Long story short, we've figured it out. So now we have hubs, which are like clinics. This is one of our hubs here. But we are using technology to really lower cost. So we keep very minimal stock. We hire a clinical officer and a, and a community health worker. And there's two staff for the hubs. So we have technology, two staff. We set it up as low cost as possible to, to get the license, which we finally got, to allow us to provide services in the rural areas. Uh, this is one, another hub before and after we sort of got into the business, if you will, of flipping uh, <laughs> local dispensaries to go into a distressed area, look for a facility that had the space, and with the limited resources, we try to turn it around. To move this from here to here, it's not, the picture doesn't do it justice, but it looks a lot better inside um, than it looks from the street, but you get the point. It cost us about $750 to set up a hub. <coughs> then I renovate it and get it clean, and then by the time we are operational, it costs us about $3,000. So we try to keep the cost very low because we have to scale this very rapidly. So this is another hub, the third hub here, and this is the community health workers. Uh, and we partnered with Cosmos, the uh, manufacturers, and this is the head of marketing for Cosmos. Now, what we have been able to do is, because we have technology, we're able to get the drugs from the manufacturing site directly to the hubs. So almost zero cost added to it, besides the cost of fuel and the cost of shipment, and with a modest margin, the drugs are the patient's hands. So our patients are getting medicines at 40 to 50% lower than the market rate with this arrangement. It's a pretty unusual arrangement. Uh, let's see, this is another hub here. 
Now, what we figured out, I'm trying to be sensitive time here, but what we figured out is that if we operated as another clinic, then we were going to go out of business. If you wait for the patients to come, you're going to go out of business. So our clinic, the hub is sort of like a reference point where we do the archiving of the data, the stocking of the stuff, but our team goes out every week to different communities. We do house visits three days a week, and we do community outreach visits three days a week. On the house visits, we do 22 on average, or 25 visit homes, and I can guarantee out of the 25 homes, you might get 25 hypertensives, and probably six diabetics. You diagnose them in the house, you take their records, and then you promise that in one month you'll be back again and bring their medicines. So keeping the cost low, creating a customer retention that is close to 100%, and also making sure that they adhere to their treatment. With the community outreach events, we get people from, who are coming from 10 miles away, they do come, and we serve on average about 120 patients during an outreach day. So we are tracking net to net better than some urban clinics with this model. And we are doing pretty well. During the outreach events, we do follow up. So the patients who we give, them, they have like uh, membership cards, they come and they do their refills. So we stock based on the, the projected volume for that particular catchment area. And if there are cases with um, uh, who have uh, some of the patients who require uh, specialist visits would organize for, specialist visit, uh, for a specialist visit. Here is a, uh, a faculty, a family medicine uh, faculty from Northwell University who spent two weeks with us last week and she was able to see a lot of patients with uh, chronic uh, conditions who needed more advanced diagnostics. <coughs> the uh, other element we're introducing the model is to be fully digitally driven. So we have partnered with, a, a, with third party uh, technology companies to improve our diagnosis and our follow up in the rural areas. One of the companies is an Israeli company, Glucomi, and they have developed a digital diabetes monitoring system where we can monitor every patient who is on Glucomi remotely. If they have a hypoglycemia, a hyperglycemia, or have not had their test taken, we're able to do an outbound call instantly and say what's going on. Their family members could also be enrolled on the, pro on the application and they would then be able to reach out to their member and say what's going on. And this is, uh, we just started this and this is really, really, really impressive. Through the Diabetes Center we can monitor remotely so we can set community targets, <coughs> we can enroll their doctor, their nurse, their diabetic nurse educator, and all of them are seeing the data in real time. Obviously, we're now doing it in the context of the hub. The question is, can we transition this into the public health system? That's another question. For now, we're not really focused on that. But we're able to show that we can monitor patients remotely, <coughs> set up care teams, and enroll patients in a rural setting. The beauty about it from a business perspective is that the patient may not be able to afford the $17 or $20 that is needed for 50 strips to do them to test at home. But if they come to the hub for 25 uh, cents, they can get tested. Our profits are better. I would say our margins per test are much better. But the access and the burden on that patient is also better. So it works for us, it works for the patient. We've also partnered with a company in Silicon Valley, Scanadu, that has developed this uh, urine pad, and we're able to test uh, with, within 60 seconds, we have all the urinalysis tested for the patients, especially women. We've detected in a random population, 26% of the, of the communities are positive for UTIs. For the pregnant women, it's about 48% pre are positive. With the app, you don't need a lab tech present. You're able to take a picture, have semi-quantitative readings for the, uh, for the urinalysis uh, results. Uh, we are exploring a partnership with a team at Emory University where you can look at uh, hemoglobin concentrations based on the picture taken on a nail bed with an app. And so you can test for anemia, 
in that setting. And there's no reagent, no microscope needed to provide that service. The only thing you need is connectivity. And these are the glucomy tests we're running. We did a 200 um, uh, uh, person study in uh, Kakamega to validate the acceptance and the feasibility of using this technology in a rural setting. We are also exploring a partnership with Philips for their belt to detect pneumonia in newborns. And this is a fetal Doppler that's also used to uh, uh, check for fetal distress in a remote setting. And this is a company that's based in, um, in Denver that we're also looking at to monitor temperature response to treatment in newborn kids in the rural setting. Where this part here, this patch here, would collect data over 48 hours and you can track response to treatment in the baby. <coughs> And this is a Finnish company that has also developed an app for looking at ear infections without the need of a specialist. So what we have been able to at least validate is that we have a potential to be able to distribute health services in a rather cost-effective way <coughs> in resource-constrained settings. And we have been able to validate a service delivery model. We have been able to establish a technology integration strategy. We are getting close to the business model. The big business is staffing model. Our ability to re recruit and train the staff to work in the hubs is one area that is, uh, we need to think about training, CMEs, how do we consistently train the healthcare workers so that they are able to practice at the, you know, um, and guarantee quality of care is, is an area that we need to pay very close attention to. And our impact and m and &E strategy is one that we always rely on Joe for. <laughs> for. We've had the opportunity to work with Joe and I'll probably, probably calling him to help me design an m and &E strategy for this work. But it is not in our DNA to be doing m and &E because it's more cost to us. And this may sound very, um, this is not the right place to say that, I know that, <laughs> but it is really tough to get the right level of staffing to do proper <coughs> m and &E. So when you look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective, this is a huge cost. Going for policy meetings in the Ministry of Health, it's a huge waste of time. So, I, I shouldn't be saying this, but at the end of the month, in the Kenya market, you have 20 days out of the month where you're productive. If you spend five days in meetings, you're down out to 15 days of productivity in a month. And so you pay your, um, your wage bill, you can get quite sensitive. And so right now, I don't allow staff to go to policy meetings until further notice. <laughs> we need to figure out a way to do that. So really that's um, where we are in terms of creating a sustainable model for getting uh, medicines, monitoring, and health education for chronic diseases in the rural settings. I'd like to acknowledge the staff. We have 18 staff uh, on the team. Our partners, Microlink Initiative. For this work, we received funding from the Pfizer Foundation. We just got a grant from Medtronic's Foundation to help us scale to 15 sites by the end of 2019. Uh, our partner, Cosmos Pharmaceuticals, for every new hub, they give us a first delivery of medicines to get the process started. Uh, obviously, the innovations in healthcare team. Thanks, Krishna. This, we were three years in incubation under the acceleration program, where we made all our mistakes and moved from pre-revenue now to post-revenue hopefully get less grants dependent, and also our partnership with Ashoka and Bernie Ingelheim. So that's it uh, in a nutshell, and I think I'll be open up for questions. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, so I had a question about how you work with other partners on ground, because this is such like a decentralized system, I guess. Um, and um, from a private perspective, how do you work with other public clinics? And like, what is your relationship with different actors in the area that also are working to improve the same 
health outcomes? Good question. Uh, we're very deliberate around engaging the uh, local health center and dispensary. So all the hubs are co-located to either health center or dispensary. Now, uh, the, the idea being that if you go to the health center or dispensary, you can get your medicines. You come to the hub, you place an order, and we send your medicines within 24 hours. So we see that, that relationship as very critical for our business model. However, there's a little, there's a little bit of stickiness here. Based on government policy, they are not allowed to refer patients from a public facility to a private facility. So you don't have direct referral, as you might think. However, patients vote with their feet. So in each area, we estimate about 200 to 400 diabetics on average, based on the statistics from the local dispensary before we set up a hub. So we, we, we have to work with them. All our CMEs, we invite the staff from the local health dispensary to come to our CMEs. The idea being that if they can prescribe accurately, then we, uh, we, it sort of puts less pressure on our staff. Now, with the universal health care coverage, we are also monitoring the, the, uh, the, the opportunity to work with them. Now, uh, in the public health facilities, medicines are free. Tests are free. Consultations are, are free. So they are pretty much the primary point of care. If we get enrolled <coughs> under the our facilities get listed under the National Health Insurance uh, Plan, the Ministry of Health calculated the reimbursement rate per patient based on the cost of service in the public facility, which is $3 per member per month. If we do that, if we enroll ourselves to the public scheme and we get $3 per member per month, whereas our services are worth $5 per member per month, we are losing. So we're trying to really understand how we're going to fit in the national health agenda without being put out of business. So we kind of have to maintain a sort of, sort of like an arm's length to protect our viability, knowing fully well that the demand would come from the public health facilities. That's a complicated answer, but hopefully that gives you a sense of it's not that clear cut in terms of just engaging. You could sink the ship if we're not careful. I have a question with sort of, sort of a narrow focus. Uh, you showed some technologies of physiological sensors that can measure breathing um, or um, pulse ox or whatever. I know that there are a lot of companies in Silicon Valley that have these physiological sensors integrated with devices, uh, smartphones. When they approach you to do like a pilot project in your country, how do you ethically and morally sort of gauge that because the, I, I'm guessing these are companies that want to perform clinical trials cheaply and they're not able to do it in the U.S. Is it mm. in that guise that they're approaching you? So how do you vet that process that they're not abusing the system mm. and using you know, your population as a testing ground for their devices? Very good question. Uh, we've been fortunate that all the partners we have engaged so far have been either FDA or CE uh, approved. So that really reduces our exposure in the Kenya market so we can easily register those products and do studies and introduce the products in the market without having to do the heavy lifting. So uh, we certainly could imagine that many companies, as they hear about our work, would want to use us to pilot the, um, their technologies in the, in the, in the Africa uh, market. Uh, so we would certainly work with them and the local um, IRB to make sure that at least from a, a study design perspective, you know, we are, um, you know, we are respecting the, the we are ethically um, uh, we're, we're compliant, if you will. Now, the paradox is that many of the innovations that we're seeing coming out of Silicon Valley and from many of the big tech hubs, they don't fit the US market at all. There's no reimbursement model. So the, we're finding that the best fit for them, like the scanner do product, was designed for the US market as a home testing kit for UTIs. But it's a product that requires a very different level of marketing to get home testing for UTIs, but it's a perfect solution for the homes. 
And so the, um, their board of directors actually said, maybe we should think about a whole strategy and make this a product for e emerging markets and try to lower our cost. And rather than put it in fancy packaging where it costs $6 per, per, per pack in the US, they're trying to bring it down to $1.52 for, um, for, the, for the Kenya market. So we're seeing some of those inadvertent <coughs> aha moments. You say, wow, it may, be, it may work better for the, um, for the resource limited settings than, the, um, than what they raised money for, which was the US market. Yes, please. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I was just curious to hear about uh, the future of the company. Are you thinking of uh, expanding this globally? Uh, because I can see some of the work that you're doing impacting other LMICs around the globe. Uh, thanks. Uh, <coughs> yes, we, uh, we are monitoring the situation closely, if I may say, <laughs> because uh, there's still a lot of lessons we need to learn from here. And for the whole model to scale, we need to show impact. So our work for 2019, 2020 is going to be heavy around demonstrating impact on adherence to treatment, uh, cost effectiveness. <coughs> so, you know, hence the pitch to say, we're looking for partners who are good at that work. You know, we're good on the ground, but certainly that's a gap in terms of being able to do that work in a way that could say uh, the hub is a valid model for health service delivery because we're breaking some of the rules around designing clinics and staffing clinics and doing that kind of stuff. So that's sort of our short-term objectives. Uh, we have been shortlisted for the um, Social Good Summit, so I'll be in Geneva, October 24th, pitching to UNDP for we one of we two one of uh, we one of two healthcare companies that is pitching this model or a model a disruptive model to address chronic diseases you know globally. So if we are if we are successful at that pitch, then maybe we might have a partnership with UNDP. And that could give us a path to, to scale. Uh, the African market is quite diverse, as you can imagine. So, uh, so we need on. So the, the barrier of entry in each country is based on the local policy in terms of can you get accreditation for this model? What are the local rules around distribution of medicines? So, for example, I was in Cameroon two weeks ago to kind of try to explore what's the opportunity there. There, the, the rules around distribution are very tight. You must work with one wholesaler importer for most of the distribution uh, for, to have access to medicines. And so we cannot save as much as we're saving in the Kenya market. That is a more open market. So, so our path to scale is really not clear beyond Kenya, I'd like to say. But there are certain low-hanging fruits in the East Africa region. I would say the model is scalable in Uganda, uh, the model is scalable in, I would say, Burundi to maybe to a certain extent Rwanda, but Ethiopia maybe not. Uh, so we have to look at the situation on a case by case basis. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I noticed you work with a company, uh, Scanadu. Uh, is that a play out the 1980s cult film Xanadu, or uh, what is going on there? <laughs> no, Scanadu, they were in the same league as Theranos, if you know the history of Theranos. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Of the, the god of destruction? Yeah. Um, no, they company. a diagnostic company based in Silicon Valley. Oh, but I just there was a, a, about five six years ago there was Theranos that was de developing rapid lab system, but it just sort of went down. And Scanadu had this device where you just put it against with infrared light, you would get your blood pressure, your oxygen saturation, your I mean almost all your vitals. It was sort of the magic you know, a gadget. It never got FDA clearance, so they moved away from that product and then they developed this one as a byproduct of their technology strategy, and this one seems to be working. Yeah, but not a, uh, I don't think it comes from a movie, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I can ask you. So we have a lot of students um, here today. Can you um, Tell us how you've had a chance to work with students and give them exposure into the types of work that you're doing. And secondly, what advice would you give them? The pathway you've taken is, is prob looks very non-traditional to the people that sit in rooms like this. So what have you learned along the way that's useful for our students to know? Oof. 
very thanks, Krishna, for that. Um, I, I personally am very passionate about engaging students in our work. Uh, we've been fortunate to have uh, very, uh, I'd say, very high energy students over the last six years. We've had, I think, nine from Duke, either from the Fuqua School and from the Policy Institute here, who have been very instrumental in doing very focused work over a two to three month period to help us answer a very specific question. So what I think we've, we've really been good at is trying to scope the project in a way that is implementable. We've also had you know, um, uh, doctoral students or master students from, from the School of Public Health at Harvard. And, and so uh, we are very open to collaborate with, with students and create short projects to help us address very specific needs. Uh, some of the opportunities that we're looking at in the short term is to help us, as I mentioned, look at and say if we implement our diabetes, digital diabetes control system, what kind of impact? So we're looking for somebody to help us drive that project. So if you're interested, certainly we're happy to talk to you about that. Uh, we are looking at models to really help us build capacity uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the hubs. So, um, so there's a lot of opportunity for, for, for student projects, if you will. Short-term and long-term projects, uh, thesis projects, if you, if, if, you, if you so desire. Now, the biggest lesson I've learned is that uh, it really boils down to understanding the customer. And uh, to what extent you understand the customer determines the market fit. And why do I say that? Is because a lot of the documents you read and a lot of the material that is published is facing towards government, is facing towards donor partners, is facing towards to meet a certain agenda, which is very fair. But you have very little data that talks about the consumer experience in healthcare. And so if you think about it as a product and a service, as an entrepreneur, you need to do a lot of primary data collection to understand when your customer is likely to purchase your service, how much they are willing to pay, who is a decision maker, all those business questions you don't have a lot of data for in the healthcare market com compared to the consumer market. So it takes a fair bit of effort and a fair bit of resources to really understand how your product would fit in a given market and for it to perform. So I'd say do not overlook the time and the resources required to understand the product fit, regardless of how bright the idea is. That's one thing we've learned. The second thing that we've learned is that, um, at least in the developing market, our strategy, as you can see, is that if you come with a, uh, if the strategy is very focused on, let's say, technology alone, you may not survive. And that's what we have noticed in the market. What we have been able to do is now we are able to control the supply chain so that we are, we are reducing the amount of uh, inefficiencies in the supply chain to, in order to stay viable. And so it's a very unusual growth path as a company where you move from technology and then you're doing distribution and health service delivery. You might say, wow, where does it stop? But we realize that we had to move from, uh, from manufacturer to patient in order for our business model to work. And so I would say, do not be shy to think about sort of controlling the supply chain in whatever you're doing as a way to be viable. Uh, we have seen our counterparts who've been very focused on either service delivery, and so they are depending on other people to bring drugs to their clinics, they are depending on other people to bring technology, and their cost is just unbearable. So those are some of the lessons that we've learned, and you know, I think hopefully gives you some insights as to how we're thinking about our, our challenges and our business. That's fantastic, thank you. And we could keep going.